All right, part 44, Law and Gospel. I know it's the first Sunday of 2023, so a lot of times this would be the time you do one of those New Year's uh, sermons where you're like, hey, here's 10,000 things you need to do in 2023. Here's 15 steps to do this and five steps to do this. And um, I'll probably talk about this more in the podcast, but... Um, I, I think inadvertently, whether we know it or not, that's very much a law-based approach. Um, I'm not saying that it's wrong to necessarily do those things, but I think we all know the reality. Everyone's like, yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And by the time you get to February, everyone forgot all those things are said that we're going to do anyway. So, Or you're in February or March, and then you feel bad that you didn't do those things you said you're going to do in January. So I, I don't know. Um, it would be interesting to see how those play out as far as the church is concerned. I know, um, I think in every area, but I, I just think it's much more of a, a law-based concept. I don't know what a more gospel-based concept would look like, but it may be something we will discuss uh, moving forward. But today, does anybody know which thesis we're on? We're on thesis number eight. Thesis number eight. So we'll read the thesis and then we'll start working on this and see what we can do. All right. Thesis number eight is the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is preached to those who are already in terror on account of their sins or the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. So the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is preached to those who are already in terror on account of their sins or the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. I think the first part we can understand, you don't want to preach the law to someone who's already broken, they're upset, they're in terror, they're ashamed, they're humiliated. More law is not going to do anything for them, right? They already, because, because they already feel, they're already feeling what the law is there for, right? The law is to bring them to terror, to bring them to humiliation, to bring them to shame, to bring them to guilt. They don't need any more of that, right? So we understand that. Now, the second part, I am going to, we're going to talk about this because I think it's an important phrase, all right? It says, um, the, or the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. So we're not to preach the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. I am very grateful that the writer of this thesis added the word securely. And the reason why is there's a lot of, dis- there, uh, this happens a lot within the Christian world and the evangelical world, is there's a lot of discussion about a Christian living in sin. A Christian living in sin. And typically the way it's discussed or taught, taught is that if you're a Christian and you're living in sin, then there's a possibility you're not really saved. And I have a major problem with that phrase. Because when you say living in sin, we need to specifically define what we mean there. Now here, we know what they mean. This is someone living securely in their sin. They're just living in sin. They're not worried about it. They don't feel guilt. They don't feel shame. They don't feel anything. They don't care. All right, that, we understand that's a different thing. But to say someone living in sin, you've got to explain to me what you mean. Because if you simply mean living securely in your sin, that's one thing. But I think, and, I, and I'm just going to try to clarify this. Because I I think there's so much misunderstanding. When I hear the phrase, living in sin, I think that phrase describes whom? What do you think I believe when it comes to that, that phrase? Who do I think it describes, living in sin? I think it describes every single person. And here's the reason I believe it describes every single person, is because every single person does what continually? Sin. So I, I don't understand this mentality. Well, no, you can't be a Christian and live in that sin. So you're telling me I can't be a Christian and live in a specific sin, but I can be a Christian and live in sin in general. That to me makes no sense. 
right? Like, it, it, and, and we know where this goes, especially in, in the church in 2022. If, so, if someone supposedly is a Christian and is living, say, in the sin of homosexuality, the immediate cry will be they can't be saved. All right, and I'll be like, okay, so, all right, so what, okay, so that sin, that throws you out of the kingdom of God. All right, well, what other sins can you live in and be thrown out of the kingdom of God? So if a, like, I mean, like, because, I mean, I don't know how that works. Are you saying a specific action? Well, even if you stop that action, what, like, say, let's take someone who, they become saved, they're in a same-sex relationship, they have same-sex attraction, and let's say, they, they stop that sin. They're like, they're like okay, I'm going to break off this uh, same-sex attraction. I'm going to try to live a celibate life. Let's say they pull that off. <clears throat> Are they still not living in sin? Well, I'm saying even if they move past that sin, there's 50 other sins that they're still living in. So why do we feel like it's just so weird that we will reduce? We have this weird view of morality that, uh, taking a drink of water, we have this weird view of morality that if we overcome one, that somehow we're no longer living in sin, but we are all living in sin all the time. So I, I'm i very suspect of that phrase because I just don't, I don't know what that means. Like, you, you can't live in a specific sin, well, but I can overcome that specific sin, but then I'm living in a different specific sin. So I, I, don't, I don't know. And so what a lot of people say it's when you're committing one sin habitually, but I'm committing all sins habitually. So I, I, I just, it's like playing some kind of semantics and I, and I don't like it. So I, I am grateful they put living securely in their sins because I think that gives a whole different vibe. <clears throat> it's one thing if someone claims to be a Christian living in sin and denies that it's a sin, says they don't feel bad about the sin and they're not going to do anything about the sin. That's a whole different creature than, well, I'm a Christian. I know it's wrong. I don't want to be doing it and I'm struggling. It's, that's a different, that's a whole different kind of thing. All right, so let's see how they approach all of this. Go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 61. First Timothy chapter one and Isaiah sixty one. Let's go to First Timothy first. First Timothy chapter one. All right, they want us to read verses eight through ten. And you, we can see what we find here. All right? I'm not going to read the sentence uh, uh, in the book. I'm just going to have us look at these individual scriptures and see what we find. 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. I thought that, that's an interesting concept right there, is it not? Properly. So the law, now I just think that that's a, this is a very important concept for this whole study. The law of God is great. It's good if it's used in a proper way, in a lawful way, which would, insi- which would tell us what? There's a bad way to use it. There's a wrong way. All right. So of, of all the verses we've looked at so far in this series, this may be the one everyone wants to write down, like at the, the very, very front of their notes. They may want to write this down. They may want to memorize this one. Now, we need to continue looking at the, the rest of it because it doesn't end in a period. But I just think that that's a very important verse. We know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. If it's not used in a proper way, if it's not used in a correct way or in a lawful way, then in a roundabout way, the law no longer becomes good. Becomes a very negative thing. And I think the church has used the law in a very negative way over and over and over and over again. That would be an interesting thing to work on. How, throughout church history, how has God's law been used 
in an unlawful way. That would be like a, a good thing to search out, or even better, in what ways in your Christian life or my Christian life have we individually used the law in an incorrect way? Let's look at verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. The law is not made for a righteous man. That's an interesting concept. The law is not made for a righteous man. Okay, I don't want to break it down too much, but let, we'll just, just each phrase here gives us plenty to pause and think about. We'll, 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 we may not make it much further than this, but that's okay. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for uh, perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. That's, that's pretty serious, yes? So they're claiming the law is for whom? The sinner. The sinner. Not for the righteous. Now, we got to be, we got to really think this through because you can see that there could be some dangers here, Right? But it's at least setting up the principle that the law is for, the, for whom? In, in a general way, the law are for those who are living in sin in a blatant, secure, unrepentant way. The law is there to try to demonstrate what to them? That what they are doing is wrong, God condemns it, and therefore they should turn from it and turn to Christ, right? And turn to him for forgiveness, In other words, it's there to try to make them uncomfortable in their sin, feel guilt in that sin. The law is not for the righteous, seemingly to imply that those who are righteous are those who acknowledge their sin, have been broken over their sin. Now we could ask if the righteous there are those who are righteous in practice or those who are righteous in position, but I will argue, can anyone... And I think this is, I think it's fair to say. Can anyone be declared righteous in a practical way? Like, look, look, look up the uh, Bible dictionary real quick for the word righteous. Let's just, I, let's just play a little game here just to see. Let's just see how this goes. Is there a long definition or a long entry? Okay, righteousness. Okay. And how do they define righteousness or righteous? There we go. Righteousness is a moral concept. God's character is the definition and source of all righteousness. Therefore, the righteousness of whom we speak is the sign of God. Okay, there you go. So, so basically, we could say righteousness, or to be righteous, is conformity to the ultimate standard. What's the ultimate standard? God. How perfect is his righteousness? Perfectly. So, in a practical way, is there ever anyone righteous? No, you can say, you could argue that one act, that you do one action that may be in conformity to God's standard, but the only problem with that is God's conformity to his righteousness goes beyond just the external act, right? Then it involves the motivation, it involves the heart, it involves the mind. So, so to be truly righteous in any action, what would be required? 
perfect conformity to God's righteousness in what? Thought, word, deed, motivation. Correct? Okay, right. That's a whole lot to get right. Exactly. That's a whole lot to get right. So, can I think now this may this may mess up a lot of people. I will argue that there are none righteous. Period. Not even Christians are righteous practically. Now, I want you to understand what that does to someone's theology. Okay, let's just play play the game. Let's go to the lordship concept, right? Now, the lordship concept says that you have to do this and this and this and this in order to prove you're saved. But how can anyone prove they're saved if there is not one righteous person? Because it would be unrighteous people taking a test to try to prove some level of righteousness to prove that I'm saved. But if righteousness is the standard to prove that I'm saved, what would be the standard? God's righteousness, and therefore what would be the result of everyone trying to test themselves to see if they're righteous enough to order to be saved? They would all, be, they would all fail because no, no one can conform. Per- so then what do you have to do? Well, the standard is not perfect conformity. The standard is trying or the standard is moving in the right direction, but that's not the standard. If righteousness is the standard, righteousness is defined as perfect conformity to the ultimate standard which we all fall short of. So, I will argue there is none truly righteous. So, when we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, now let's take it up. I'm going to read it this way, but we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. All right, so how do you use it lawfully? Well, number one, the law is not made for whom? The one who is how, what kind of righteous? Let's go, verse 8, okay? The law is good, right? If what? If it's used lawfully, right? And so, how, what's the right way to use it? Well, we start off, the law is not for whom? The righteous person. What kind of righteous person? I don't think that's practical righteousness. Does the law is not for whom? Those who are positionally righteous. Because again, who would be practically righteous? None. So what does this mean? The law is not for someone who's declared positionally righteous. Now, we got to be careful here because we're going to walk into the accusation of antinomianism here in about 5.2 seconds. But but I'm not the one. Look, it's not my problem. You can come up with all the categories you want. My issue is I got to deal with the text. Do you see why I don't think that that's practical righteousness involved there? Because practical righteousness, I would need the law every single day. Why would I need the law in my practical righteousness? Because my practical righteousness is never really that righteous. Correct? All right, so positionally, why is the law not for someone who's been, who is positionally righteous? Right, I, I'm already forgiven, everything's taken care of, I'm saved, and the law has been what am I, uh, for me? Fulfilled perfectly, perfectly. So, but the point is, I think the point Paul is trying to make is this. Someone who is righteous doesn't need the law, one, because it's been fulfilled, and two, to be declared positionally righteous, I've had to acknowledge what? That I'm practically unrighteous. Right? And if I'm already acknowledging that I'm practically unrighteous, already acknowledging that I'm a sinner, already acknowledging that I deserve condemnation, I don't need more law because I'm already acknowledging it. So who is it? So the so if we're going to use the law right, rightly, it's not for the righteous person. The law's primary fo- primary it's primarily focused on whom? It lists all of the sins, right? The sinner. But when it says the sinner, it's those who are what? How does it describe these people? Does it describe them in a past, present, or future, or present tense? But for the lawless, disobedient, ungodly, uh, and for sinners, for unholy, profane, it's describing people in a present state, right? 
So what it is saying is for people who are living in this lifestyle, and I think what it's meaning is living in their lifestyle, as the thesis put it, in a secure way. That that they're just doing these things and they don't care. In fact, they would probably not even be acknowledging that it's sinful. The law is for them. And what is the law's, what is, is the, now this is very important. This is very important. Is the law designed, and I want y'all to really think about this because I think there would be, I think we would get different answers if we asked people in different churches. It, what's the law's if we're going to use the law pr- properly for these individuals, what are, what, when we give them the law, what is it designed to do? Is it designed to make them better? And that they need what? An alien righteousness. Right? Because sometimes um, someone, uh, someone sent me, uh, my, one of my friends in Nebraska, they posted a video, and it was of... Um, I can't remember the individual, but it's uh, basically like an atheist and agnostic basically going after the Bible, right? Basically saying the Bible is useless, right? Because the Bible justifies some really bad behavior according to them, but that the fact that the Bible does not produce better people. Well, that's the whole problem is Christianity seems to teach that the Bible and the law was designed to make us better. The law was never designed to make us better. It was to show us our, how bad we are. It's not there to make us better. It's there to drive us to what is better. And what is better is not more righteousness for me to try to live it out. It's for a perfect righteousness that's imputed so that I can be declared righteous even though I still I'm not righteous. And why do I know I'm never going to be righteous? Because I'm never in this life going to be conformed to what? To perfect righteousness. Remember, righteousness is conformity to the ultimate standard. So I I, I can understand when Paul says the law is not for the righteous... It's not for us because we're, all the laws already been fulfilled for us. And B, to be declared righteous, I've already had to acknowledge my unrighteousness. So I've already accepted what the law says. And then for the sinner, this is for the sinner who is blatantly living in their sin. They're not repentant. They don't accept. They don't, and, and the goal of giving them the law is not so that they will live better. It's so that they will come to Christ. And too many times Christianity is running around. And that's why so many Christians want the Ten Commandments posted everywhere, right? Because the argument is it will make people what? Better. That it will make society better. That people will live better. But what is the, that, that to me is a theological complete misconception. The law doesn't make people better, right? I mean, if, it, if the Ten Commandments did what, they, what people thought they would, well, why did Israel turn out so bad? Didn't they have them? Right? They were supposed to have them posted, right? Memorized, right? Carry them literally with them on their arm or right before their, uh, on their forehead. They were to talk, uh, the law, the law, the law, the law. And all of that discussion and memorization of the law, where did Israel end up? Just read the book of Judges. Can it get any worse than that? I mean, I guess technically it could get as bad as it was during the days of Noah. But the point is, the law did not make them better. What did the law do to Israel? It condemned them, right? It it revealed to them that their actions were sinful. So I just think that that's very important. So we need to, I I think 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, we need to spend a lot of time really thinking about because I think it's very important. Now go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Let's see what we're going to find here. Isaiah 61. Everybody ready? Verses 1 through 3. All right, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. You probably are familiar with these words, all right? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and of the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn and Zion, to give unto them the beauty for ashes, the oil for joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. All right, now, are, is, does the New Testament make uh, use these verses? Okay, what's a good cross-reference to these verses? Give me some good cross-references to these verses. Okay, someone says Matthew 3. Let's look at it. Matthew 3. All right. Where in Matthew 3? Yeah, I think they're just, uh, I think that cross reference is just going with certain words like spirit. Oh, there's, there should be some good cross references here. Luke 4.18. All right, let's try that one. Luke 4.18. All right, here we go. Let's go to Luke 4. Let's start in verse 14. Let's read, get the context. This is very important. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto, into Galilee... And there went out a fame about him uh, throughout all the regions, right? And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom, he went into the synagogue to read uh, on the Sabbath day, and he stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, right? And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was Written, and what does it say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach, or upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. All right, so go back to Isaiah 61. How much of it does he read? Until he doesn't mention the day of vengeance, does he? All right. But he mentions everything else. Now, immediately when you see all of this, we, we, oh, well, there's a lot we could do, but let's just look at the basic concept here. This is a reference, obviously, to a gospel message, not a law message. The law is to show you your sin and convict you. The gospel here is offering what? Let's go through all the, all the promises here in Isaiah 61. Look at all the positive things that are mentioned here in Isaiah 61. We could look at the Luke 4, but we'll just go back to the original text that's given in the book. Isaiah 61. Let's just try to make a list of all the positive things. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings... How does the NIV translate good tidings? Good news. There's, there's literally the idea of the gospel. So this is really the message of the gospel contrasted with the message of the law. The law is like, hey, you're a bunch of sinners. This is gospel. So good news, right? Good news. And good news to whom? The poor. Now, we could... We could try to take this and make this very like, like we're talking economics, but I think we know what this is a m much more of a reference to. Poor, probably in what way? I think this is so, th those who acknowledge the poverty of their own morality, the poverty of their own spirit, which is whom? Well, this is every single person who is, pover who is, who is poor in spirit, right? In the sense that, Everyone is, everyone is poor, mo morally speaking, before God, right? If God's, if God's righteousness is the standard, 
then we all fall way short of that standard. Yes, so therefore we're poor. Now, I understand the poor here may be a reference to one who acknowledges their poverty. Yes, because we've already realized if they won't acknowledge their poverty, what do they need? Law, until they acknowledge their poverty, then they need gospel. But so good news to the poor. What's next? Bind up the brokenhearted. Now, the binding up the brokenhearted would be most likely brokenhearted over what? Their sin. Because, uh, because once again, if we're not careful, we'll turn the gospel into a solution that it was not intended to fix. Does the gospel fix every bro- being brokenhearted over everything? No, it doesn't. It's never designed to do that. The good news is designed to, to help to, to, to mend up the brokenhearted over their sin. All right? We have to be brokenhearted over our sin. Then the gospel is there. What's next? Liberty to the captives. Now, this is where I think we can at least begin to see, did Jesus walk around emptying out the prisons? No. So immediately we know that there's a, that there's a spiritual element to this, right? I don't want to allegorize it, but we have to be very careful not to make this super literal because clearly Jesus wasn't walking. I mean, he didn't even get John the Baptist out of prison. So clearly, no, no, no. What, what, what is he saying captives to the, to the prisoner? Or liberty to the, those in prison? Liberty, uh, liberty for what? Those who are in prison to their guilt, to their shame, to sin. Now when I say fr- set free from sin, not set free obviously from the power of sin, because we still sin, but set free from what? The condemnation and guilt of the sin. That's the, o- that's the only way we can understand this. All right, what's next? Okay, once again, an opening, uh, opening, an opening of the prison to the bound. This, again, is not like a real prison. This is the idea that we are spiritually bound. We're spiritually condemned. The good news comes to set these people free and then uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, if we skip the day of vengeance, uh, to comfort all that mourn. Mourning over what? Their sin. Yeah, so that, that's the point here. So it's drawing the contrast of this. The, if, the law, this is, if the law and gospel are going to be used properly, the law, is preached, the, law, the law is not preached to whom? If we're going to use law and gospel properly, the law is not preached to whom? To the righteous. Remember 1 Timothy 1.8? 1 Timothy 1.8? It's not preached to the righteous. And what righteousness are we referring to? Positionally righteous, because there are no practically righteous people, right? Because we all fall short. And when we say it's not preached to the righteous, what do we mean? It's not preached for the following reasons. Number one, because the law has already been fulfilled on their behalf. And number two, to be declared righteous, one has to acknowledge their unrighteousness. They already acknowledge their unrighteousness. They already acknowledge their sin. All right, so does that make sense? And so who is the law for? Those who are living in unrepentant, bold, blatant sin, and they won't acknowledge it, and they won't even accept responsibility. And then the gospel is for whom? <clears throat> According to Isaiah 61, the broken, those who are mourned, those who know that they're a captive, those who acknowledge their sin, then you pour out the gospel to them. That's what the, the, this thesis is all about. Does that make sense? I, I, I hope that makes sense. Now, let's see how the, what the book does. Are right, everybody ready? 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. And Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, show us that according to God's word, not a drop of evangelical consolation or comfort is to be brought to those who are still living securely in their sins. Some who, someone who's living in blatant, open sin, they won't acknowledge it, they won't accept it, They are not to get any comfort from the gospel. None. Now, the minute they acknowledge it, then we pour out the comfort. They go on to say, On the other hand, to the brokenhearted, not a syllable containing a threat 
or a rebuke is to be addressed, but only promises conveying consolation and grace, forgiveness of sin and righteousness, life and salvation. So for those who are living securely in their sins, what are we not to give them? Not a drop of evangelical comfort or consolation, nothing from the gospel. They get none of it. But for the person who is brokenhearted, understands their sin, and see their sin, what are we not to give them a drop of? We are not to give them a syllable of what? A threat or a rebuke. We are to give them what? All the gospel. Grace, comfort, restoration, that's what they do to get. That it, it's like the book is being very emphatic. Do not give these people any gospel and do not give these people any law. We got to know who to give what to and then that's all we give them. The church is not so good at that, right? When is the church really good at giving only law and no, uh, or only giving gospel and no law? When do you think the church is good at that? Giving gospel and no law. When do you think the church is really good at that? The initial salvation, right? The initial salvation, what do we say? Jesus died for you. All your sins are forgiven. Everything's wonderful. Everything's great. Yes? Okay. When are we not good at giving someone the gospel? (laughs) From that moment on. After you're saved... Law, 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 law. And if you mess up, what do you need to hear more of? More law. Oh, we may say, well, this is how we always say, Jesus will forgive you, but... And now, you need to do this, 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 you need to stop doing this, you need to do this, you need to do this, and you need a 15-step program, and you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, and we still don't know if you're going to be ever worth anything. And then you're like, well, wait a minute, where's the gospel? The gospel, and so what, it's almost best to do what? Now, it's best just to say, this is really the way Christians should work it. You know what, guys? I thought I was saved, but I wasn't. So I'm going to accept Christ today, and then, well, then you get all gospel again, right? I guess you get, you get off the hook, right? Because now you were committing a sin as an unbeliever, and you know all the sins you committed as an unbeliever are what? Or wiped away. I, re- I, I have seen this game played out. I have seen this game uh, played out in the minds of some believers. And typically it comes into the whole divorce, remarriage kind of thing. Because typically what someone will say is, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got divorced and I did that before I was saved. So now it doesn't count. So like, that we play these weird games. The point is either the gospel forgives completely or the gospel doesn't. But we, we have a hard time with that, right? Why do we have such a hard time with that? Because we're afraid if we don't, if we don't measure it, then we're afraid that someone's just going to say, okay, well, then I'm forgiven, then I'm good to go. Well, e- either, it, either it's all forgiven or it's not forgiven. Like, what do you, it's like, well, there's got to be consequences. Look, I'm not talking about illegal actions because obviously illegal actions have to be turned over to the authority and there's legal consequences. We're not saying cover up illegal actions. What I'm saying is that for whatever sin someone has committed, either the gospel completely forgives and we're, we're all, and it's it, interesting, where do you find the supposed consequences? Right, because we're the ones who come up with a list of consequences, Right? Let me give you an example. It would be very hard not to say that what Abram, I mean, I think the Bible would even argue what Abram and Sarah did with Hagar was messed up, right? I mean, at least, even from a, I mean, there, there's nothing there that would say Hagar even, can, even if you don't want to say that it was rape, I think it was, even if you don't want to say it was rape, clearly it was adultery, yes? What were the consequences for Abraham? 
You can, say there were, you can say there were consequences and that Ishmael came along and it created problems, but I'm saying there was no consequences from God. God didn't like, hey, 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 I made that covenant with you. Uh, we got to find a new person. Hey, I'm going to take away all your riches. No. When Abram lied, hey, this is my sister. In fact, every time he did that, what came out of it? Do I? He got material blessing. He got richer for lying, right? I, so I'm just saying there's, and now you could say, well, David, there were consequences. You could say that, but the, cons- the baby died. He still got the woman. He had multiple women, right? David committed multiple sins. In fact, da- David had someone killed. According to the Bible, David was supposed to be, was to die, right? If you, if you kill someone, isn't that kind of the biblical model? Moses killed someone. Well, I'm just saying there's these situations where you're like, where there's consequences. Wait a minute. How about Solomon's consequences, right? I mean, he was committing sin. I mean, if, they, if we always say, well, David had consequences. He didn't get to build the temple. But Solomon did? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just so weird. Well, Peter had consequences. Peter was immediate. Peter went from a, a, someone who denied Jesus three times, and before you know it, he's preaching a sermon. Why wouldn't the other disciples preaching the sermon? Because you think you could get someone better than a person who denied Jesus three times. So I'm just saying that we, we always want to try to find a formula saying, if you do this, here's the consequence. If you do this, here's the consequence. I'm not saying there aren't any consequences, right? But those consequences would have to be at best temporary and that the gospel should be able to do what? Forgive and restore. If not, it's not gospel, it's what? Law. And we want law mixed into it over and over and over and over and over again. Because we, I don't know why, we're so law-minded. Now this, make sure we understand, does the gospel excuse sin? It doesn't excuse it. It offers forgiveness for it. And completely, it doesn't say that it was right. In fact, it says that it was so wrong that it required the death of Christ to bring you that forgiveness. By no means does it undermine or minimize it. Like, it's hard to find that balance. But what we have a tendency to do is we want the law constantly given to people, constantly given to people. Now, you could argue that there are some elements of Christianity who are, so they don't want to give uh, people the law when they need to give people the law. So the, there, there, there's an imbalance. Christianity has always struggled with the balance, right? Some can be so law-minded that they, they almost water down the gospel, and some people can be so gospel-minded that they don't ever want to give anyone the law. So according to this, who, who should get nothing but law? Those living securely in their sin, they don't care. They don't get any gospel. None. But who should only get gospel and not one element of law? Those who are broken and see their sin. You don't need to give them the law. You give them nothing but the gospel. And the book is emphatic. Not one syllable. Not one Not one other thing is offered. Right? We're going to have to stop here. And then we'll just, we'll try to just at least mention this one, or at least start this. All right, here we go. This was the practice of our Lord. They say that this is the exact way Jesus handled himself. He was approached by a woman who was a sinner, Luke 7, 37, who in the presence of self-righteous Pharisees, knelt down, washed his feet with her hot tears, and dried them with her hair. She was crushed when she came to Jesus. There was no one to comfort her, but she returned to Jesus, for she had realized that there he was, there was the throne of grace. The Lord did not utter one word of reproof because of her sins she had committed. Not a word. He simply said, your sins are forgiven. 
And another, a similar instance, he dismissed the guilty woman with the assurance, neither do I condemn you with the brief admonition, go and do not sin again. Meaning that what they're, what they're arguing is that for the most part, many cases, Jesus did not do what for people? He didn't mention their sins. He didn't condemn their sins. But then in other situations, what did he do? He offered, the rich young ruler, did he offer any words of comfort? Not one. That, that's, the, that's, the most mind, that's the most mind-boggling story ever. That, that, like the woman who clearly is living in some kind of horrible sin, he doesn't mention the sin. Right? Just comfort. And then for the rich young ruler, for the, yeah, and for the rich young ruler who seems to be like, hey, what do I do? Jesus is like, well, keep the law. Well, okay, well, then go sell everything. And the guy's like, uh, okay. And he walks away. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, no, come back. I got some comfort for you. He doesn't offer any comfort. Sometimes you're baffled by the fact, wait a minute, the Pharisees, did he uh, offer comfort to them? Blasted them. No comfort. But then some tax collector or woman caught in adultery, it's just like, and you're like, well, wait a minute, Jesus, shouldn't you tell them how bad they are? No, they already knew how bad they are. Uh, believe so. Right, right. So, yeah, there's always, there's always that uh, weird, and sometimes it's confusing, but it just shows that there's a time and a place for law, and there's a time and a place for gospel. All right. We, we didn't get as far as we wanted, but we'll stop right there because I hear cars outside. All right. Let's stop. All right, Lord God, we come before you this morning. We are grateful for an opportunity to start the new year, still trying to understand the difference between law and gospel, and I pray that as we hopefully can finish this series this year, by the time we're done, we have understood this doctrine better than we have ever understood it in the past. But knowing that we still are, will never completely understand it until we're in your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said.